The history of math is our intellectual foundation to understanding science. Science, beautiful, awesome, wonderful science. It's the creative foundation to our ineffable future. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Burchak, and this is my podcast, Math, Science, History. I often promote my website, mathsciencehistory.com, which I built myself. Of all the hosts that I've been with, my experience with Bluehost has been the best. What I really like about Bluehost is their customer service. It is top notch and they are always there to help me. So if you're looking to build a website or you're looking to move to a new host, I highly recommend Bluehost. You can access Bluehost through my affiliate link, which is www.bluehost.com com slash track t-r-a-c-k slash math science history all one word bluehost is fantastic and they are affordable it's only $3.95 a month if you sign up for 36 months so if you do the math it's $142 to start and for me it was the smartest business investment i've ever made One of the many joys about Facebook is that as the election looms, on the horizon, you get to have heated arguments with individuals on Facebook about all kinds of weird things, like wearing a mask during a pandemic. One individual that I got into a discussion with stated that for every doctor that tells us to wear a mask, there's another doctor that says the mask is not necessary. Statistically, I know this is not the case. That would mean that the countrywide debate would show that 50% of doctors doctors would want us to not wear masks. In my research, I could only find two doctors that advocated for not using masks. However, the American Hospital Association, the American Medical Association, and the American Nurses Association put out a letter urging Americans to wear a mask during the coronavirus pandemic. So if we were to consider that of the 950,000 practicing physicians in the United States, that two of these doctors do not advocate for masks, then the statistics would be that 0.0002% of doctors do not advocate for masks. That is exceptionally different than 50%. And this leads me to today's topic, statistics. Statistics are awesome. Do you know why? Statistics can get anybody out of an argument. If you've got the numbers and the data and the facts, you can get your point across like that. So what exactly is statistics? Statistics is the process of collecting data and analyzing it for the purpose of inferring proportions in whole from sample representations. For example, in a poll of how many people in the United States enjoys apples or bananas, a sample of polls would be taken across the country that would accurately represent the entire population. So if we were to poll 10 people in 10 different cities across the country and gather the data as to who prefers apples over bananas, bananas, we could then come up with a statistic that represents the country as a whole because the sample size represents the opinions of everybody across the country. For the record, 75% of consumers purchase bananas while 73% of consumers purchase apples. The process of gathering data has been around since Homo sapiens and Neanderthals have been able to count. 30,000 years ago, someone decided to count up to 55 by putting deep notches in a bone. This is the infamous wolf bone that was found in 1937 in Czechoslovakia by archaeologists. These notches were arranged in groups of five, with one group of 25 notches and another group of 30 notches, hence our earliest version of statistics. We We also have evidence from archaeological sites in Turkey of flat, two-sided throw sticks that were used as dice that date back as far as 3000 BCE. So now we're looking at early use of probability and not just data gathering. We're looking at humans playing with numbers and understanding probabilities and statistics. So for as long as we've been counting, we have been gathering data and using statistics. In 2000 BCE, 
Yu the Great implemented a census to evaluate China's population. Statistics was most overtly evident in our histories from the 4,000-year-old Plimpton 322 tablet, which shows notation that helped the Babylons conclude how much food they needed for each Babylonian. By 300 BCE, the Roman Empire was gathering data every five years on its citizens. As a result, every man and his family were required to return back to their place of birth in order to be counted so that they could keep track of their population. Not only was it useful in determining how many people were inhabitants of Rome, but it was also useful in determining who was paying taxes. This process continued well into our current age. In 1086, William the Conqueror ordered the production of the Domesday Book. It was an inventory of land and property that covered all of England. Oddly, Winchester and London didn't make it into the book, but its purpose was much like the Romans. They wanted to be able to tax the owners on the land. By 1279, King Edward I also commissioned an inquiry into landholding in England for tax purposes as well. Fast forward to the 17th century. In 1603, three primary individuals helped to establish how we work with statistics today. These three were Blaise Pascal, Christian Huygens, and John Grant. These three gentlemen contributed a great deal to the statistics that we understand today. Blaise Pascal and Christian Huygens were both academics. Blaise Pascal was a French mathematician, physicist, inventor, and a Catholic theologian. He was one of the first inventors of the mechanical calculator, which carried out addition and subtraction of two numbers, and also performed multiplication and division by repeating the process of addition and subtraction. Pascal often corresponded with Pierre de Fermat, and the two of them worked considerably on probability problems, specifically the rolling of dice. The two primary probability questions that they worked on was, how many times can somebody throw a pair of dice before one can get double sixes? The other question that they focused on was, how will the stakes be divided if the game of probability was stopped before it was complete? Christian Huygens was a Dutch physicist, mathematician, astronomer, astronomer, and inventor. Huygens published a book on probability called The Value of All Chances in Games of Fortune. In this particular treatise, he referenced several of Fermat's problems. This work was so significant that it actually established a standard and was used for about 50 years and influenced further statisticians. But one of my favorite stories about statisticians comes from the 17th century and a story about a haberdasher. A haberdasher in the UK is somebody who sells items to make men's clothing, such as needles, ribbons, buttons, cloth, and zippers. John Grant was born in 1620. His father was a draper, and by the time he was old enough, he began to work for his father's shop, eventually taking over as a haberdasher selling small items for sewing. What's most unassuming about Grant is that in his life, he did more than selling retail products. He was a self-taught mathematician. And though statistics and census gathering had been around for over thousands of years, John Grant became an expert in population statistics. Statistics. In February of 1661, he and Sir William Petty published a paper titled Natural and Political Observations Mentioned in the Following Index and Made Upon the Bills of Mortality. It's a long title, but the concept behind it was that he was the first person to draw on statistical inferences using factual data. In this particular work, he determined the living and mortality rate in London. What's significant about Grant's work and this particular paper is that he provided probabilities of survival for each age group. And what's interesting is that even though it was a probability of survival, this particular bill of mortality did not include the ages of death. This book was foundational to the beginning of public health statistics. Thus, Grant became one of the first experts in epidemiology. This particular paper put him on the map of mathematics. By 1662, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society. And what's interesting about this particular paper is that it allowed medical experts, as well as the government, to understand the conclusions about the mortality of individuals as it related to diseases. And what led Led to his work on this was his skepticism about the number of deaths that were contributing to, quote, liver grown and, quote, 
spleen diseases. During this time, many deaths were brought on by rickets, which was a skeletal disorder brought on by lack of calcium, phosphate, and vitamin D. Rickets is a softening of the bones that leads to skeletal abnormalities in children. What Grant discovered was that these other deaths brought on by, quote, liver disease and, quote, spleen disease were actually brought on by rickets. As a result, through his data and his life table, he determined the death brought on by rickets was at a max maximum high in the year of 1634. Additionally, this paper that he wrote alludes to his character. He was a humble man, and in the paper he writes, How far I have succeeded in the premises, I now offer to the world censor, who I hope will not expect from me, not professing letters, things demonstrated with the same certainty, wherewith learned men determine in their skulls, but will take it well that I should offer a new thing, and could forbear presuming to meddle where any of the learned pens have ever touched before, and that I have taken the pains and been at the charge of setting out those tables, whereby all men may both correct my positions and and raise others of their own. For herein I have, like a silly schoolboy, coming to say my lesson to the world, that peevish and touchy master brought a bundle of rods wherewith to be whipped for every mistake I have committed. So basically he says he's not offering a new discovery, it's just that he found something that he had never seen before. And though he seems to humble himself and make him appear as though he is less intelligent as his contemporaries, this move actually served to pique the curiosity of his academic contemporaries and led them to respect him even more. Sadly, on September 2nd, 1666, in the King's Bakery, right by Pudding Lane and right by London Bridge, a fire broke out. This fire spread so fast and so extensively that it lasted for four days, swept through central London, and destroyed over 13,000 homes, 87 parishes, St. Paul's Cathedral, and the government buildings. Grant's home was among those homes. At this time, Grant was a manager of the New River Company, which was a clothing firm. The fire led to financial troubles for him. Ultimately, he had to file for bankruptcy. And then, less than 10 years later, Grant died from jaundice and liver disease. He was deeply missed by the city. His work as a self-made epidemiologist and statistician provided a platform for medical health experts and the government to understand mortality rates and the rise and spread of diseases. Statistics are phenomenal. What I love most about them is that they serve as the perfect tool for argumentation and for lively dinner conversation. So though I don't have statistics on when the pandemic will end, I do have some interesting statistics for when you're sitting at the table with your family and looking at them for the millionth time in the last six months and wondering what to talk about other than the current politics. For those of you looking for ideas, I offer the following statistics. Statistics show that your odds of winning the lottery are 1 in almost 14 million. 1 out of 3 adults sleep with a teddy bear or other type of whoopee. As for me, I sleep with my chihuahua. I know she's not inanimate, but she's so old she might as well be. Americans read for pleasure less than 10 minutes a day. More than 36 million Americans can't read above a third grade level. 45% of Americans think that ghosts are real. 1.5% of college football players actually go on to play in the major professional leagues. 31% of Americans don't know their neighbors. And according to State Farm actuaries, Americans have a 1 in 175 chance of being audited by the IRS, 1 in 215 chance of dating a millionaire, and 1 in 220 chance of writing a New York Times bestseller. But most importantly, according to the World Health Organization, wearing a mask reduces the spread of coronavirus by 82%. Additionally, keeping a distance of six feet can be even more effective. Additionally, as of May, 42% of coronavirus deaths have taken place in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. 2.1 million Americans live in those nursing home facilities. Additionally, more than 7% of America's population struggles with autoimmune disorders, and 5% of Americans are cancer survivors. So the next time you leave the home, think about where you are going. Activities such as flying and going to bars are high risk. Also, if you're leaving home without a mask, stop for just 
a minute and think about somebody else. Think about somebody's aging parent or a friend with a weak immune system or a coworker who has recovered from cancer. They are at risk. The mask protects all of those who can suffer from the worst of this disease. And I happen to know that 99.999% of all American doctors would agree with me. Thank you for joining me at Math Science History. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe to the show. If you could also please leave me a rating or a review, I would love that. If you want to learn more about the history of math and science, please visit me at mathsciencehistory.com. And if you like what you're listening to, please feel free to click on that coffee button and buy me a cup of coffee. Every cup of coffee that you buy helps me keep this podcast up and running. Also, if you're interested in leaving me a comment or chatting with me, you can always find me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Goodreads. Just search for Gabrielle Burchak. Thanks for listening. Until next week, carpe diem. Thank you.